until about 1.30 on the afternoon of January 2nd, 1879, the chief standing there wrapped the body of his only son in a buffalo robe. He put it in the back of a rickety buckboard wagon. And he and 29 others, 11 women, 10 men, and 9 children, they began walking from north central Oklahoma, 550 miles north, back to their beloved Niagara home. On the day they left, it was 24 below, it was 24 below zero, not wind chill, the air temperature. These 30 Ponca who were heading north on foot had virtually no money, no food, and no clothing. When they left on January 2nd, 1879, the United States government had signed 171 treaties with the American Indian people. And on January 2nd, 1879, the United States government had broken all 171 treaties. But standing there was not going to break the promise that he had made his son. So despite 24 below, despite no winter clothing, despite no food, despite no transportation, Despite no money, with bare shields back, body in the back of the wagon, they began going north. On the third day out, the blizzard that was coming out of camp intensified and the wind chill dipped to 77 below. So they had to tunnel into haystacks and put the very young and the very old inside these tunnels to keep them from freezing. The men rummaged for field corn by day and boiled it over an open fire. And one week at a time, one month at a time, they kept going and they kept going and they kept going until they were two days from the sacred burial sites. And that's when the United States Cavalry caught up. They caught up with them and they turned them around and they marched them back to Fort Homo. And when these people came across the lower parade ground of Fort Omaha that you possibly have been to, there was a man standing on the porch of a magnificent red brick three-story house watching this parade of 30 people straggle across the lower parade ground in late March of 1879. His name was General Brigadier General George Cook. And when he watched these 30 people go by on the lower parade ground of his fort, he was horrified and shocked and dismayed at what he saw. Because what he saw were a lot of the women had clumps of blackened flesh like charred bacon hanging off of their elbows, hanging off of their wrists. Some of the children faces had turned black because they were so severely frosted from going through 77 below weather, from marching all of this way in January, February, and March across north central Oklahoma, walking all the way across Kansas, walking almost all the way across Nebraska. And so many of them were barely alive by the time they reached Fort Omaha on March 27, 1879. And General Crook was mortified, and he didn't quite know what to do. So he did what all military men do, and General Crook was a military man through and through. He was a Civil War hero. He had fought Indians in the American West all of his adult life. He had won many medals of valor and he knew that the chain of command was everything. So he went back up to his headquarters and he telegraphed his superior, <clears throat> General Philip Sheridan in Chicago, 30 pounds of prisoners have just come into my fort, what should I do? The message that he had sent was to General Sheridan, who several years early had famously said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. General Sheridan wasted no time in replying to General Cook's message. And General Sheridan's orders to General Crook in Omaha was the next morning, turn their faces south and march them back from whence they came. George Crook knew that was a death sentence. These people could hardly make it across the lower parade ground of Fort Omaha, much less be walked, forcibly marched from Omaha back to the Indian Territory. So I can imagine him late that night on the third floor of this magnificent general's quarters at Fort Omaha. I can see him pacing back and forth because General Crook at bottom was a good man. And the longer he was around American Indians, 
was the more he began to respect who they were and their culture. And I can see him pacing back and forth in that study on the third floor of his house at Fort Omaha. And that needle of his just walking back and forth between his civil conscience on the one hand and his military conscience on the other. He had a direct order to turn these 30 Ponker around the next morning and march them back to Oklahoma if he knew that none of them were made. And so about 3 o'clock in the morning that night, he came down from his third floor study. He went to the stable. He jumped on his horse, and he rode three miles south and knocked on the door to the office of what would become the Omaha World Herald. And the door opened, and it was the editor of the Omaha World Herald, a man that he knew by the name of Thomas Henry Tibbles. And he was invited in because Tibbles was late working on an editorial that was going to run uh, in a couple of days. General Crook came in, he told Tibbles what the story was, and he said, I think I have a good story for you. Now, I've been doing this storytelling and journalism, fact gathering, <coughs> schmoozing with sources for 30 years. And for 30 years, I have been waiting for a Brigadier General to Facebook me, to tweet me, to knock on my door and say, Joe, I've got a really great story for you. As it happened, not holding my breath, I don't think it's going to happen. But in late March of 1879, it did happen to Thomas Henry Tibbles inside the office of the Omaha World Herald. And so Thomas Henry Tibbles began doing what all journalists with a social conscience do, began pounding out one story after another.